Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I mean, Monty's correct. Crushing defeats there for TSM in this tournament did not go well. Uh, if we look at this matchup specifically, we did see the Bard come through. There's an element of uh, fun there, but to no avail, right? You, you would hope that pulling that out as kind of a pocket pick would have been, you know, uh, an answer, something special that puts them over the edge. Yeah, I mean, they still have a huge flaw in their actual strategic gameplay, which is what we thought was a strength, for even in the lane swaps. And I mean, it looked like Dyrus was playing zombie mode Scion by playing mostly in passive form, but it's not his fault. It's a whole collaborative team effort in not understanding where they need to put pressure and at what time. The other thing I want to look at is the Mundo. We talk about Bard coming in. Mundo is something that we haven't seen very much of in this meta, especially Smite TP. Yeah, and I like the commitment to the Mundo because what it had was with the Smite TP, with Urgot as well as Corky as your two AD carries, you're never burning that guy down late game. So even if something does go wrong early game, there is no way that Mundo dies in a late game team fight. We've seen him get absolutely massive. He does so much damage as well as a frontline tank. I really like the adaptation that came through from ADG. I think a problem that occurred in the draft was the fact that when you pick Bardi, you don't want to lane with him. He's not the greatest laner. And Corky does not do very well versus Kalista. A skill shot based AD carry can usually get outplayed by Kalista's passive, you know, hopping around, dodging phosphorus bomb, a rocket. So they opted to go for a lane swap, which was a good idea, you know, get rid of this. But Bard wasn't used to roam around. Since Mundo has the smite, as you mentioned, he can jungle faster. He's safer in the lane than the Scion. No man that could just farm away from the Q. And you saw even at one point, he almost soloed out Lust Boy. Yeah, we saw a lot of comfortability, too, on the side of EDG, even with some of these new picks. Uh, the early game played out very well for them. They had the successful tower dives to TSM's failed tower dives. And so, again, that early aggression, uh, if they're able to do this in the bracket stages, there may be no stopping them. Yeah, and this makes them really scary. That's twice now that they've pulled out the Rek'Sai Callista, something they weren't willing to really do in the LPL, and that makes them an even deeper team to try and contend with. And I agree, they're putting a lot of faith in their jungler. If you go Smite TP, you're trusting on Clearlove to get you ahead at some point and to cover up some of the weaknesses of that, because Mundo should be the person success susceptible to these dives. He's a guy that... Even before he took Smite, no escape summoners, you tried to dive him. I think a difficulty also was the summoner decision from Lust Boy. By taking the exhaust, you, mm. you hinder your ability to go for the tower dive. You don't really need an exhaust versus the Kalista versus the Azir. Like, these guys get really, like, they are usually in a safe position, and the Mundo needs an ignite. Urga didn't even take an ignite. There's no ignites in that game. How are you ever going to deal with this Mundo? So they got outdrafted and outplayed all around. Yeah, and once again, Bjergsen in the mid lane didn't go that playmaking champion we're looking for. Went with Urgot, and Urgot is extremely strong in the current meta, so props for him for picking that one up well. But I just don't think he's ever going to have the impact he needs to have on the international stage if he doesn't play something like the LeBlanc, the Ari, that can get around the map and really try and help his team out. Picks and bans coming to question for TSM have been a question throughout the tournament. EDG, on the other hand, though, we look at, again, that Callista coming out, and they talked about how playing Callista is almost just a pick-ban strategy for them, saying, ban it against us later, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they did all the right things, honestly. The routing, specifically from Clearlove, Clear was excellent. The pathing in the jungle, the itemizations, the timings for gangs, how Korra just kind of stuck around in the top lane, just barely within XP range, able to actually farm whenever he wanted with the smite because Clearlove was somewhere else, can take over that jungle. I mean, they really exploited TSM right now. Yeah. Espawn, I know you believe Clearlove is the best jungler in the world. Spirit, come on. Uh, no, I think uh, Spirit okay. is the best jungler in the world. I think oh, Clearlove is the best uh, jungler here gotcha. at the MSI tournament. I definitely think Spirit he even showed it against him. He had that mm -hmm. crazy Nidalee game. But the thing that Clearlove does better than anyone else is cover for his lane's weaknesses. He's willing to get out of the jungle a lot. I think that that really puts him in the pinnacle of junglers out there. I think that he also has an adaptive playstyle, something Clearlove wasn't able to boast in the past. Did used to try and farm up a little bit to the late game. So I like the way they've developed. In general, I think the Pawns game was the impressive one here because showing the Azir pick really does add like that next layer again. Because this is all about now. EDG had clinched. They needed to get in there and they've done that. All right, well, we talked a lot about the early game, the playmaking there from EDG and how they got ahead. Let's send it over to the Telestrator where Irene and Sheepy are going to break it down for us. All right, thank you guys. I am Zyrene, standing by with Fabian Sheepy Milan. And we're going to be breaking down a play for you guys from the early game. 
And like Jad said earlier, there's a lot of questions here back in NA about how TSM has been performing and why has it gone so poorly. And out of the five games here, we've seen Dyrus be first-blooded in four of those five games. And it's not always his fault. A lot of it is lane setup, picking the bard, not going and actually shoving waves on time. So, Fabian, walk me through the early game here. Um, I feel like my application as coach is sometimes to shed on the light, especially in those lane swap situations. Tower dives are really eminent, and I think we should just jump right into the replay here and just show how it just failed for TSM to prepare the tower dive, or either way defend it. Um, what we see here is at the around 2.30 minutes mark, um, bot lane, EDG started harassing Dyrus, and he got a lot of minion aggro, and so it's slowly pushing towards him. And they have two decisions. Either way, one, they start hard pushing it, they bounce it against the tower and then freeze it, or they prepare the tower dive. And as we see on later, they go for the tower dive. So EDG starting the tower dive here. On the flip side, on the top lane, we have as well a non-frozen lane. And what TSM is doing here, they see the top laner coming in, and they just have the wave in the middle for no reason. And what we see here is happening is Kilov going for the red buff, going together. Santorin going for the red buff. Top lane is not pushing in, so they can't go for the tower dive. And this is the time where Lost Boy and Santorin either way needs to both TP back, because if one of them TPs back, top lane TP can come bot lane and they have a four versus two. Or what's going to happen, he's just going top lane. Don't yeah. do anything. It's 100% gank now at the bottom side. And Dyrus is like, where's my team? Either way, make the top lane dive happen or defend bot lane, and none of those happens. And we actually can see how Dyrus is doing really well in this situation, forcing two flashes and get the farm afterwards. And what we can see also in two minutes later, that he's actually 10 CS up and he's 0-2. So if we just roll the clip from here on out, flashing the hook, really, really nice play, getting a lot of DPS on Mako, getting a lot of uh, DPS on Clear Love, dying here, getting all the CS afterwards. And what is happening afterwards is really, really important because they need to recover from this. It will slow push towards the enemy. And if we just run forward and see how Clear Love is actually going with his jungle rotation, what he's doing, he's instantly putting pressure bot lane again because they don't swap the Thresh into the mid lane. They keep the pressure bot lane. So Rexa is going towards the mid lane, Santorin is going back as well, and they should try to actually get any kind of cover around this area down here. This is really, really important so that they prevent another tower dive because if Dyrus dies again, it's going to be really, really bad. So clear love, ganking mid lane, no wards at all at the bottom side. And Dyrus again, guys, either way make a top lane happen, freeze the lane, or help me at the bottom side and he gets caught out. Well, San Santorin had wards too, and he goes immediately after checking his raptors. They're not there for a couple seconds. And why is he top lane? Why is yeah. Lost Boy top lane? If he's freezing the lane, and he doesn't need to be it's there. It's extremely predictable too, and because four really out of the five games. And really important, they had wards around those areas. He was totally fine freezing top side, and I think this is just to show why Darius is dying so many times. It's not his only effort. It's actually a team effort, and I think that's really important to notice. Yeah, and Clear Love didn't even do a jungle camp. After the gank goes back, comes immediately middle to pick on Bjergsen, win that lane a just little bit, knowing how to goes do, bottom. Yeah, just knowing how to do the jungle rotation effectively and setting EDG for a really successful game. Yeah, I really think that he's just trying to farm champions all the time and at least get his laners forward instead of getting some farm for himself, and that seems to be the prevalent style here. Yeah, I think that this is how you should play right now, and this is how we see actually most of the games going forward. Um, tower dives are really eminent, especially the TP play. You need to do a lot of mind games, but once you've figured out and you actually feel yourself in dire situation, you need your team to do something. Because if you're on an island, you are on an island, and your other team needs to create the second island for the enemies. All right, thank you so much, Sheepy. We need to step away for a moment, but when we return, the European LCS champions Fnatic take on international wildcard Besiktas with the last spot in the semifinals still on the line. Stay with us. What team is that? They all say EDG. Oh, wow! How many can he get? Hit with that death sentence. There's the devil, and he's not done yet. Teleport coming in for TSM. Dyrus trying to turn that one around. Oh! Oh! Death dies to the turret, and a little bit of help from Wild Turtle. Meanwhile, Mango <laughs> getting taken out as well. They can't follow up because there's nothing to follow up on. Pawn coming in for a bit more damage. They're going to take out Ghost Dyrus. Nice double knockup. Wild Turtle, they still haven't killed him. Oh! Are you kidding me? 
27 kills in 25 minutes for EDG as they take the game over TSM.